as you can see, this sonata just started and it stops already with the fermata after the eighth bar. Well, this is something Haydn is using in many places. Actually, it can even be called the master of surprise, the master of stops. There are seven of them in that sonata, meaning that if you do the repeat, the performer has to deal with 14 stops. That's a lot of stops to deal with because, of course, each of them have a different meaning and should be treated in a different way in order to make the, the music speak and even more interesting. Because usually, most of the time, what Haydn does after this pause is something you don't expect. He's playing tricks with our mind. I remember Hashkenazi telling me, well, Haydn is very clever. He's almost too clever. He always plays tricks with our mind. And this is something I must say I'm personally very attached to with Haydn music. Another um, aspect of that uh, sonata and first movement is its minor key. Out of 62 sonatas that Haydn wrote, only five of them are in minor key. B minor, C sharp minor, the big C minor, and the other one in E minor. And that's it. With this one, only five. And definitely this one is the only one which has a presto as first movement. Which presto is usually used as finale to make the thing brilliant. Beethoven wrote 32 sonatas and only two sonatas starts with a presto. So it's a very unusual um, feature. Presto is a notch faster than Allegro. So this sonata should sound fast and of course with a kind of nervosity and anxiety that um, unfaces both the minor key and the fact that it's full of stops and, and full of, uh, of questions. Now, let's concentrate a little bit how this first movement is built. We can consider, really, Haydn the father of the sonata form. He's using, most of the time, two main ideas. But um, unless what Beethoven will do later on, like two really contrasting themes in character, in mood, and in texture, most of the time, the second idea that Haydn is presenting us use elements already of the first one. For example, in that particular case, if we play the right hand alone and connect all the right hand alone of the first phrase, it it's uh, actually, it gives us the second theme. And the, the first one has to be played without pedal, where in the second subject we could eventually use a little bit homeopathic pedal because we don't want... That will be too blurred for me and I think we will miss the 2 3 one, two, three, one, two, three, one phrasing. So the pedal could be used only on the second uh, uh, crotchet if necessary. Another thing they share in common is the fact that both 
themes, or both ideas, start a phrase, stop in the, in the silent, and restart the phrase again. Therefore, as I said at the beginning, it's important to see how we deal with that pause. The first time, we have a, a the last motif repeated three times. There is different ways of dealing with that. A ritenuto will not be totally out of place here, I think. But what I think is important that if you choose to have a little ritenuto here, I'm just wondering if it's necessary to have a ritenuto at the end of the second subject. If they have things in common, we have to make sure that they don't have the same character. Therefore, applying the same ritenuto, I think, is probably less efficient than having one ritenuto and one straight. It's also possible to have the first idea going straight to the fermata, and reserve the, the ritenuto for this charming little simple cadenza. This is personally the solution I choose. But everything, of course, is absolutely open until Haydn himself is telling us by SMS or email that we are totally wrong. Now, this said, something which is different from both themes is the way they treat both hands. It is very important that from the first, for the first theme, this figure is played without pedal, we have one hand playing staccato and the other hand playing legato. While on, for the second subject, both hands are more melt together. Another, another um, um, important point for the second subject is the polyphony at the end of that section, because we have some interesting chromatism between the E flat and the D, and then after the E uh, natural. And the cadence in could eventually be even ornamented, but that's another question we will raise later. Whatever solution you choose for before the first fermata, what I think is very important is we don't want the listener to think that you made a mistake and you have to start the piece again. So what you do with your hands on a pure choreographic point of view, or let's say body language, is important. I think to have a more efficient effect, it's, you have to think as if the, uh, about almost in a cinematic, uh, cinema effect, that when the music, the film, pardon, when the film stops and you have a freeze, the time freezes on one particular picture. And I think it's important that your hands don't move, at least for one or two seconds. It might be very long. It all depends on the tension you want to create. But the fact that you don't move and that you don't connect with a beautiful gesture about is important. We want the music and the time to freeze here. Now, what's happening between the two themes is, of course, very important. Because we have a surprise of G major. By the way, this is written forte, and the beginning of the piece was written piano. That tells us that this piece was not written for harpsichord, but was written for an instrument which was able to play piano and forte. And Haydn need contrast in order to have surprises, as we said at the beginning. So uh, you can always choose between forte or even fortissimo. Haydn always complained about the lack of power of uh, the instrument of his time. Now we have a wonderful <laughs> Yamaha here instrument which has a lot of power and we should definitely use it. Now, what's happening here? This is tricky, and I would like to uh, maybe give you a, a few uh, optional exercises. This is not easy to play. Of course, rhythms are always an option. 
But what you could also consider is um, um, an exercise that almost summarizes all the rhythm options. I have absolutely nothing against uh, rhythm, which I use my, myself when I practice. But uh, I would like you to consider the option where you don't think so much of your fingers going down, but of your fingers going up. In other words, if I do that very slowly, the first note I have to play is a thumb. But I don't think so much of the thumb. I think about the fifth finger going out. Now, the next note I have to play is a three is a C with my three, third finger. But I don't think so much of my third finger. I think about my thumb going up and so on. For example, now I think about the thumb. I think about the second. I think now about the third one and so on. Of course, this has to be done slowly. I think it's very effective. There is a little bit of rotation we have to think of every, uh, every first beat. And now if we... And so on. The next section is very interesting and that um, gives me the possibility, the chance to speak to you about uh, what I think is one of the golden rules of music, Leonard Bernstein explained that extremely well is in, in his Young People concerts, which I really advise you to have a look at. He calls that the one, two, and three rules of music. You can apply what I'm going to tell you now for many, 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 many different uh, examples in music. It consists of, it, it's applying of when you have twice the same little motif repeated. The third time the motif is repeated again but goes in another direction. Meaning, that's the first one. The second one is exactly the same, but the third one goes. And so on. So the third one goes in a totally different uh, direction. One, two, and three. Not only the third one goes in a different direction, but it's much longer. Therefore, it's better not to start the third one exactly the same way as the two first. You have many, many different options to do that. You can play that with dynamic. Play the two first forte and the third one piano. Or the opposite. Or you can do minus plus minus. What is important is that the third one is different. You can even play with legato. Let's say legato, same legato, and now staccato. What I think is important is that in Haydn, we have to be creative. We have to be creative in many ways because the text gives us actually very few indications. We have to respect them, the one they have, the, the Haydn wrote extremely well with very, very big care. But actually we have very few indications of, of phrasing or even dynamic in the, these two first pages. I just have a piano and a forte, that's it. It's up to me to, to make the text alive for us, for our ears of the 21st century. And as soon as you have set up a mood and you have a clear picture of what you want to express, in that case, a little bit of nervosity, anxiety. Some things are funny in that, in that movement also. This is rather light, but the general mood of that piece can be in a way dark. It calls for the, the, the minor key. But what I want to say that as soon as you have set this and you have a clear picture of that, every tools possible you will be able to use, like ornamentation, make a crescendo here. You have to reorganize, to reconstruct the, 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 the piece in order to make it alive and sparkling. And actually, most important, not boring. Um, about the first theme, I think it's important 
um, in order to have a sparkling sound and speaking um, uh, pizzicato or even, yeah, uh, to have the end, the end firm and practicing.